Excellent. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, on a special day on Teachers' Holiday, we have a guest at our studio, uh, Professor Michael Hammond from Warwick University. Uh, Professor, can you tell us a little bit about your life, your, uh, your overview of academic background, research interests, and the teaching experience? Well, my background um, is a slightly unusual one in that I began by teaching. I was a teacher of foreign languages, of English as a foreign language, mm -hmm. um, and then I worked in school and I became interested in computers and technology. So then I started doing teacher projects, working with other teachers. And through that I became uh, a teacher trainer, I was training teachers in technology um, at Warwick. And uh, through that, after about 10 years of that, I became more interested in the social science side and became interested in the broader notion of carrying out education research. And I became a little bit of a uh, specialist on research methods and on the use of theory in research. Mm -hmm. So looking back um, it's been a kind of very pragmatic approach and it's a kind of different approach to a different kind of career to what ma most people have today which is degree, PhD, postdoc, academic post. So I would say I came from a practice background mm. and it's been a long journey to, to develop the expertise within an academic uh, mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. I can see, Professor, you have a very uh, experienced uh, life and you have a very rich background. And I was really interested how you balance your academic life and your personal life and your personal interests as well. Absolutely. I think that's a great question because I'm really <laughs> worried about work-life balance and um, I always think I came slightly at the wrong time in academia because in the early days of academia when I talked to colleagues it was a lot less intensive than mm -hmm. it is today. Mm. Um, I remember a someone repeating a conversation that they overheard which was uh, people were uh, quite angry or upset if they were expected to be in the university every day mm. and they wanted to make sure they had a four-day <laughs> weekend mm. and writing a paper wasn't a great expectation for many people it was a, it was a, an option not a requirement mm. so um, I think it was easier to have a work-life balance in the past but I think it I think it's right that being a public sector it was right that we do more work and we, we uh, raise our expectations but at the moment I see so many people doing nothing but work mm. so I think it's really important to do something outside of work work. Um, I, I'm interested in sport, I'm a sports person, I like running, I like playing tennis. I like, and tennis, I like running because I'm, in, in running and tennis I meet people who aren't academics mm. and I have a way of understanding a bit more about what's going on in the world and um, sharing stories and understanding lives much better than if I only meet academics. But more than anything, it allows me to switch off. Mm -hmm. One thing I think is really important is to limit how available you are online. So people are working through with technology, they're online 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. well, uh, right up until the last minute. My children are, you know, I can text them at 11 o'clock and they will give me a reply. I was talking to my daughter the other day on a, in a Saturday and she started looking at work uh, because she was wanting to keep up. So I think it's um, very important to have a work-life balance and I think it's very important to close down technology nine or ten o'clock and have someone at home to tell you off. Um, mm. So in my case I keep a work-life balance because my wife tells me off if mm -hmm. I work mm -hmm. too long um, and that's very important to me. Uh, you mentioned here about work-life balance and that's a very interesting topic but how about work-work balance? Because you said that the most of the people they're busy 24-7 days 
because of this online rigid mm. working. How about having a work work balance? So you uh, need to have a work balance. It's not twenty four seven. Yes, you need to have you need to be you need to have a work balance. And I think one of the things I say to people is when you're sort of is when you're theorizing, when you're working at academic work. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is really helpful is to go walking mm -hmm. and just to think about things um, and get away from this sort of intensity that I must read two papers, three papers today. Mm -hmm. I must write 500 words. I must mm. do this. I must see so many students. Mm -hmm. And just to take a break by you're still working, mm -hmm. but you can still have a sense of getting away from it and thinking about, but yeah. still thinking about things, thinking, but thinking yeah. about thinking things in a important. different way. Mm, I agree with you. Thinking is very important, especially for the people who work in academia. We're so, supposed to be thinkers, yes. 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 Could you tell us about your recent research projects? Um, I and can maybe do. your recent publications? Yeah, my interests. Recent, mm -hmm. see, I would say, one of the things I would say, I've been very pragmatic about the direction of my research you know I've been and I think it's something because I've been interested in technology and other people interested in technology are similar to me the, because they're interested in technology they're pulled into different types of um, different sectors different types of subject matter and they uh, go with it they run with it so you know you might be dealing with primary teachers one day interested in working with small children with technology mm -hmm. and you go oh, yes I can do that I know about technology mm -hmm. but yeah I know nothing about primary schools mm -hmm. so um, through but I always say yes because I learn so much from it from working with people in those in different sectors you know when I look back I haven't done the same thing over and over I've done very different things mm -hmm. And this has got an advantage because it means that I'm more interested, I've got an interdisciplinary feel um, for, um, for education, for social research, um, but it can also be a disadvantage because you know, it takes a long time to specialise in any mm -hmm. particular area. All that is a long answer to a, sh to a short question. And for example, some of the recent work I did was um, Twin Towns, Twin Cities, mm -hmm. which I had no background in, but I was just interested as a, as a citizen in, in twinning and twin cities. And I did a project around uh, Coventry, my hometown, and about the twinning that, they, that, that our city does with other cities and what people had learnt from it. Mm -hmm. um, I've also done um, recent re research on theorizing technology, so it's a much more sort of academic, conventional um, work. And um, I've also done work on um, a project on working with uh, teachers' experiences of lockdown. Mm -hmm. What did teachers do during lockdown um, when they're having to use technology to work with their students? What did they learn? Mm -hmm. What was their, mm -hmm. what were the outcomes? Can you share about your recent book publications? Well, well? yes, of course. I mean, just to show again how my work is very varied, I um, began, I mean, some recent work was uh, about uh, doing education research. Uh, other research, other books were on doing social science research. Uh, another one was on um, technology and theorizing. Another one was on writing, academic writing. Mm -hmm. So they, and that, the academic writing one reflected my earlier interest in foreign language teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. and a book on the Nepalese teachers and teachers in Nepal mm -hmm. during lockdown. Mm -hmm. So your main research area is technology. So in your opinion, uh, how do you think, what are the most significant challenges or the opportunities uh, that this field offers? I think, I, I'm not sure that it is actually my mm, I wouldn't foreground technology research. I would say it's one of my long-lasting interests. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm very interested in collaborative learning, forgetting about technology. I'm interested in cooperative learning. Um, I'm interested in teaching and learning in general, and I'm interested in what people learn outside of teaching. Mm -hmm. But technology is reflecting on 20, 30 years of technology research. I think one of the most important issues for those of us researching technology is to strike this balance between optimism and pessimism that every technology that's introduced comes with it with excessive optimism so people say um, education television in the 1950s they thought it was going to change the world it didn't um, labor language laboratories in, in foreign language teaching was going to change everything uh, you, you know this better than better than I do but they were going to change everything um, but they didn't um, computers in schools were going to change everything but they didn't um, you know but they do they do change some things and that's really important but it's also important uh, to realize the constraints and the difficulties that technology bring. So what I think is incredibly important is to strike a balance between excessive optimism over uh, technology, which those introducing technology and those selling technology have, and excessive pessimism, which is what resistors have, you know, it won't make a difference, it's not it's um, it'll be used in the wrong way etc etc and to find a way in which we say yes it has advantages and we can use it in this way and it all depends on our imagination and our creativity in how we use it mm -hmm. uh, professor you've been teaching and you've taught so many students as well as you supervise so many students uh, all over the world and you have many students from different countries and I would like to know what would be your advice for young learners nowadays how they can get bet, best out of their learning and the students and how they, when they were studying at the college and university level I would say to them um, but I would say to them firstly don't do what I did when I was a student because I was a terrible student um, and so I think I would say to them to take advantage of every opportunity that they have even if it feels outside of their comfort zone mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, for example international students it's it, language can be such a barrier but you're not going to get better at language unless you participate, unless you use language. So I think I would say to people, you know, do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Even if you are feel out of your depth, you know, take advantage of go to the seminars, mm -hmm. go to anything that's open to students. Don't just stay within your compulsory courses. Go to seminars, go to talks, you know, a university like this one or a university like Warwick, there's something every day. There's someone giving a guest lecture, there's a workshop put on by the Students' Union, there's a workshop put mm -hmm. on by um, Student Services. There's something happening every day mm -hmm. that you can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would say, Mm -hmm. Do it anyway, even mm -hmm. if you're not, um, you know, even if you're not, uh, even if you've got worries, even if you don't feel confident, mm -hmm. just pretend and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any inspirations? Where do you get the inspiration to do research? And what is your inspiration outside academic life? Do you have favorite books to read, the movies that you like watching? <laughs> okay. It's a very good question. I probably have, but they don't come to mind at the moment. Um, I belong to a book group and we read a book every month and talk about it, uh, a novel usually, um, and we've read some great novels. Mm. Um, we read one recently called Gentleman in Moscow and mm. that was a book I never would have read but mm. it was extremely interesting and that being able to discuss was extremely interesting. Um, the films, uh, yes I like a lot of um, I like a lot of films, I see foreign language films and mm. as you know I've seen one film in Kazakh, Kazakh. Um, which, was ex which was a beautiful film. Um, and I, 
is that I felt inspired, not because research and social science had made a big impact on me, although there were things that I read which I thought were good. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what I was doing, a lot, of what, a lot of what I was reading as a student or being asked to do was not talking to me, you know, was not my voice. You know, I couldn't see my voice in some of the, in a lot of the work that I was reading about and listening to and, expe and expected to do. And I wanted to find my voice on this and to say, yeah, I've looked at this and I think this. Mm -hmm. So what inspired me is to express myself mm -hmm. and to have a way of, to, for me to find my voice, which is not just somebody saying, oh, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with this, but offering a positive mm -hmm. voice about what um, technology can do and what social science can do and to try and make that voice accessible to students and I've been I've thought about this quite a lot and I think I'd, I think I'd much rather say I'd much rather someone who read an article of mine and say uh, and said well I don't agree with your theoretical output I would find I'd say fine it's good but I would be really upset if they said it was badly written and I couldn't understand what you were talking about. Mm. That, that, and that would be a failure on my part. Mm. Um, so I, I'm very concerned about finding my voice and finding a voice which, um, which other people can relate to, I hope. So dear professor, can you share with us, uh, with your re future plans for research, if you have any potential projects that you're thinking of doing or maybe some collaborations with someone? I'm thinking of some collaborations. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in the history of technology, so I'm interested in reviewing the history of technology mm. um, with colleagues, with a colleague. Um, I'm still interested in the way we theorize technology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I kind of think I should be interested in artificial intelligence and I'm kind of interested in the way in which that fits in a story of how um, technology is going to change everything. You know, technology has changed a lot, but we mustn't exaggerate how much it has changed the world. There's still a lot of things, a lot of ways in which people behave with each other which are very consistent mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But somehow or another I can imagine that um, I'll take an interest in artificial intelligence at some point. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that the technology is prevailing nowadays and there is a lot of disruption with the technology coming in. What do you think, what are the students uh, like now as they were five years ago? Yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. are you Actually, before I answer that one, I think I was really, what I, what I should say, what really is interesting about future plans and technology is that no one really knows. You know, I think someone asked me this question a couple of years ago, you know, what, would the, what does the future look like? And I said, well, if I knew what the future looked like, mm. I wouldn't be here, I'd be on a yacht somewhere because I would have predicted the rise of Apple computers, I would have predicted um, text, texting on phones, I would have predicted a lot of things that, frankly, people didn't predict. Mm. So I would say one of the most, thing, most important things about technology is to keep an open mind mm. um, and to, you know, is to reflect that we get it wrong and everybody has got, got it wrong in small or big ways when it comes to technology because there is something unpredictable. But maybe there's something unpredictable in society, you know, in general, that this isn't just technology, this is society and uh, uh, how quickly it's changing. I would imagine a country like Kazakhstan has changed incredibly quickly in a short space of time. Um, so there are, uh, there, there's an element of unpredictability and that keeps us interested and uh, involved, engaged in carrying out research. As regards students, the, I couldn't really say over five years, but I think of myself as a student and I see students today. Mm -hmm. 
And the thing that really hits me is how hardworking they are, mm. um, how engaged they are. We were very, very <laughs> lazy, I should say. And we were very, um, we were not very deferential to, mm -hmm. to our lecturers. We were part of a generation that was saying, well, you did it wrong. We, we're now going to make, change the world and do it right. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly arrogant of us and that was terribly mm -hmm. wrong. But um, that's how we felt and we didn't really work very hard, I have to say. Or at least we pretended we didn't work hard. Mm -hmm. we, we carried it out in secret, the, the work. Um, and what hit me when I first started working in Warwick and stayed with me is how hard people are working and how much they want to do well. Mm. That, that was never our um, intention, you know, mm. we, so I've noticed that. Um, I've noticed that um, uh, students are also very much more aware of the wider world. Um, they're thinking about experiences which might help them in work or in, in civil society in ways that we never did. Um, and I think in general, they're ever so nice to, to their teachers. I know it's teacher's day today and mm. they're being very nice to teachers especially, but they are very nice to teachers and they're much nicer to teachers mm. than we were when we were at university. Um, so I'm really, I think they're, I think, um, often we have in the papers stories about uh, how students and young people are um, bringing problems, how they're always on the phone, how they're always, they're never, they have got poor personal interpersonal mm. skills. But I don't think any of that. I think I find them very engaging, uh, very able to talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Very interested in the world outside, mm. very interested in inequality in the world outside mm. and how they can change it. Um, very interested in gender rela relationships mm -hmm. and how um, they can change attitudes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I, I know it's, <laughs> it's easy to say this because it's comfortable for everybody to believe it, but actually I do believe it. Mm -hmm. I think they are um, going to, I think they are, um, how can I say, admirable in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. As a re I'm a researcher as well, so of yeah. <laughs> recently when I was reading a research paper, I came across a little story uh, about a teacher who kept asking during her lesson, what do you learn from the lesson today? Do you understand everything? Did you learn something? What do you learn <laughs> from the student? And at the end of that lesson, one student raised her hands and said, what did you learn from the lesson today, teacher? So do you think as a teacher, you learn from students something in every lesson? You, yeah, that's a great uh, question and you put me, and sometimes, admittedly, no, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're on autopilot, you've done the lesson 10 times before, 20 times before, you do, you do it. Um, maybe you're tired and you're, you just do it as routine. But nearly always there's something you learn about yourself, mm. about yourself as a teacher, what you're good at, what you're not so good at, what works, what doesn't work. And you learn something about your subject mm -hmm. by preparing uh, the, ta the, the, um, the, the lesson and by listening to what people say. So I, I'm always interested in things like, um, uh, for example, learning styles. There's people who've done a lot of work on learning styles and it's, it's interesting. Um, and I was explaining some of this to students and then a student said, Oh, well, doesn't it just simply depend on the context of what you're learning? You know, that you'll be a different type of learner if you're learning to play football than if you're learning mm. to nuclear physics. And, and I said, 
Why, yes, that's <laughs> that's really interesting. That's yeah, that's absolutely the case. And I said, there are people who spend a lifetime working with learning styles who don't say that, who don't recognise that, and you've intuitively just told me that straight away. Mm -hmm. And I find that really interesting. And I I learn about the field and the the cracks in the field mm. through what the students say as mm. much as I do through, through papers. Um, and I learned from, I mean, I was, I've worked with teachers a lot and I've learned from their stories of teaching, of, uh, of their stories of change. I've learned about the conditions in which they work and how they, those conditions have become much more intensified, much more challenging. Um, one of, uh, and I've learned from uh, international students about how things are different in different countries um, and, and how things are actually the same in different countries. Um, so uh, I'm always learning from students. Probably I've learned more from, uh, in terms of subject matter, I learn more from um, PhD students, obviously, like yourself um, when, in the past, um, when, um, when you have this sort of relationship where you're, you're looking at the thing together mm -hmm. and you are learning as you, you're, I'm learning from, from my student and the students are hopefully learning something from, from, from me. And I get an, a really intense, view of their data um, without having to collect it, <laughs> which is very, uh, very um, fortunate for me. So yes, I would say all of those things. Uh, I'll give you an example actually was um, one student came to me to research technology and in the end she said, after six months of getting not very far, she said, well, actually, I don't really want to do technology. I want to do vocabulary acquisition. Mm. And I said, well, I don't know anything about vocabulary acquisition. And she said, yeah, no, but we'll manage. And we did. And I learned from her an awful lot about vocabulary acquisition. Mm. And she learned a lot from me about research methods and research and making claims and presenting work. Mm. So that was, you know, uh, that was very interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Can you share an unusual story? Well, about working with the students. Unusual stories. Actually, well, most stories are unusual because everybody has a different story of their of their, um, everybody has a different story of, I remember one, for example, I remember one student who was incredibly self-motivated and, um, you know, she knew what she was doing. She didn't really need me very much mm. at all. Um, except every six months she would, or, or three months or something, she would go, she would get in a panic. And she would say, come, she'd knock on my door and say, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I'm go, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, um, okay, so, uh, well, what's the problem? And she'd tell me what the problem was, and to be honest, I didn't really understand what the problem was at all. I didn't really understand the, the, the exact nature of the problem. But I just said, oh, okay, what's the problem? And then she spent 10 minutes, 15 minutes telling me about the problem. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. So um, what are you going to do about your problem? And then she spent 10, 15 minutes um, telling me what she's going to do about her problem. And at the end of it, she said, uh, at the end of it, I said, well, you haven't got a problem anymore, have you? So you're just going to go and do what you're doing. And then she said, no. You, uh, no, no, that's, uh, I've, I've, I've solved it. Um, you are brilliant. You're a brilliant supervisor. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, what, what a kind thing to say. Because from my point of view, all I'd done was ask two ask questions. Question. And I didn't really know very much about the topic. But um, <laughs> so, and I think about sometimes I've spent hours with people um, and they've gone, Okay, 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 and they've never turned around and said, you're a brilliant supervisor because I've asked them difficult questions that's upset them, uh, not upset them, but unsettled them. Um, and only after they finish would they say, you know, that was helpful and what have you. But that's, that lady was absolutely um, 
uh, she was very um, aware of her what she needed and how she could mm. how she could do things um, so that was fine um, that was very nice I think that this kind of practice helps researchers to explain their complicated topic to young generation to young people and their own language as well so professor thank you very much for taking your time and being here and uh, we're really happy to have you here Mm, well, really, thank, thank you, thank you very, very much, much for inviting me yeah. and thank you very much for, for interviewing me today. I think next week I'll interview you, if that's okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you.